We're going to take you to a realm, the boardroom and the C-suite, and get you thinking about how inspired and important your function is within those realms and how critical those million hires are to what the board and the uh, C-suite executives are thinking. Be before I do that, let me introduce myself <coughs> and these two wonderful women here. Uh, I'm Coco Brown. I am the founder and CEO of an organization called Athena Alliance. In fact, actually, there are probably 10 or more Athena women that you will be hearing from over the course of the next two days as speakers, roundtable discussion hosts, etc. Athena is a digital platform that brings together the top women in business and helps activate for them learning and access to opportunity. What opportunities do these top women want? They want the C-suite, they want the boardroom, they want to get into bigger realms of leadership and broader impact outside of uh, their, their single uh, organization that they work with. Prior to uh, starting Athena, I ran a company called Taos for 10 years, an IT professional and managed services company based here in the Valley. I've been in the Valley for 27 years and leading tech companies for the last 20. Uh, and I now serve on the board of a company based in, in Minnesota called Archer Point, which is an ESOP, an employee-owned uh, employee, employee business. To my left here is Kathy. Kathy Zwickard, uh, her earliest career was in tax, and while her 20-plus years in leadership have been leading the people function, she continues to maintain her CPA. Um, which actually is a very important uh, uh, tool for her on, on boards. She's led tremendous growth. Uh, she most recently, before joining the board of Avalara, was the CHRO of NetSuite, took them through their IPO, through the acquisition by Oracle, and she is now on the board of Avalara, which IPO'd in 2018 um, with a fun upward stock ride ever since. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those good ones where you look at the max of the stock and it just keeps going up. It's really nice. Um, and a $7 billion market cap. And Michelle here uh, to my left as well is the co-CEO of He Said, She Said. And she is a film, that is a film production company, and she is a film producer. She was the executive producer of Beautiful Lie, which tells her own story of the transition from being Michelle, um, Anthony to Michelle. Um, formerly, Michelle was the CEO of Imperva. Uh, at, a time, uh, at that time, a hot Silicon Valley public company in the security space. She actually has quite a few runs as CEO um, at Verity, at Autonomy, uh, Interwoven, and others, and she served on the boards of Blinkus and Proofpoint. So the three of us, as you might be able to tell at this point, have quite a lot of board experience, uh, as well as seed suite experience, and we'll be talking about how top executives and boards think about talent. But before we jump in, I want to frame this for us. This is Larry Fink, and he looks like Wall Street. Uh, he is Wall Street. Larry Fink is the CEO of the largest asset management company in the world, $7 billion of assets under management. What that means is that he is investing uh, on be at BlackRock on behalf of a lot of us into indexes for mutual fund or for pension funds and for families for people who are saving for retirement and homes and education. And Larry Fink writes a letter to CEOs every year, and he has been doing so since, I think, 2012. Um, and his CEO letters <clears throat> in the early days started off very much like, you know, Wall Street-like, you know, financial, fiscal, quarter over quarter performance and what he's looking for. And in 2018, he's, his tone started changing, and he started talking about how incredibly important it is for boards to focus on culture and purpose leading to profit, um, on, and, and essentially is championing the rise of conscious capitalism. He talks now about the environment, about diversity of skill sets and people, and how critical that is to um, the success of companies on the, on the long, long term. In fact, actually, he talks very little about quarter over quarter performance any longer. Um, why is he doing this? It's because he knows that the consumer is in the driver's seat. Right? It used to be that companies could just 
sort of pay to create the narrative and tell us what to think and what to buy. But now it's pretty much free to share our thoughts with each other, and to share what we're learning with each other. And so without, with the exception of government intervention, we kind of control the narrative now. So companies have to listen. Um, and so this is what he understands. So, and in his, uh, you know, there was an article with him recently where he said, uh, you know, our board spends, uh, today spends a day and a half every year reviewing talent in every one of our businesses. That's a lot of time for a board to spend when you think about the fact that they get together once a quarter. So, and diversity, you know, what he knows is that diversity leads to better business results. Um, this is just five data points. There's so many data points on this, this topic. But the fundamental bottom line is, if you have the right kind of diverse people around the table that is making the decisions for the long term and thinking about how it impacts the world and your community and your buyers and your employees, you will have better decisions. And better decisions learn, lead to better results. So what's going on in the C-suite and board? Uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, the focus is culture, equity structures, compensation philosophies, leadership, leadership succession, uh, evolving workforce. So in the boardroom, they're thinking about these things on mass scales, from small companies to large companies. What do we need to do to instill the proper culture, to get our equity structures and comp philosophies right? to make sure that we've got a great bench strength in our organization and to evolve our workforce. And finally, uh, one thing that I think is super exciting for all of you here, and then we'll get into this, is you may be recruiters, you may be VPs of talent, wherever you sit in the organization, you should know that you, you have the opportunity now as a leader in the people function to go all the way. I wrote this article back in 2018, why a CHRO is the, must next, is the next must have uh, role in the boardroom. And I was floored. It got two times the likes of any Larry Fink LinkedIn article and about half the likes of Ariana Huffington. And I assure you, I am not nearly as popular as either, either one of them. Not nearly as well known. I have maybe 8,000 followers and Ariana has 8 million. But this struck a chord. So um, with that, I'd like to join my peers here and uh, ask, ask you guys, if, is there anything that I didn't share in your introduction that either of you would like to add to it in terms of who you are before we jump right into questions? I think you got it. That was great. Yeah? OK, good. Well, so I want to talk with, uh, or start with Kathy then. Kathy, as a former CHRO uh, and people leader of 20 years, and now a board director with a very successful public company, as I was sharing, tell us how you are bringing talent discussions into the boardroom, and maybe also start a little bit with what is the boardroom for, these, for this audience? Sure, happy to. So it's interesting, when I first met Coco in 2016, um, the concept of having a head of HR in the boardroom was not a strategic mandate, certainly. It was maybe a nice to have, a way to round it out, a way to maybe get a woman on the board. And as Coco and I got to know each other and started strategizing, we really felt that actually it's an imperative, it's an important aspect to have in the boardroom. And lo and behold, back in 2016, certain current events were occurring with Uber um, and some other companies here in the Valley that actually really made our case for us. So where a board traditionally is responsible on the people side is, number one, hiring and firing of the CEO. That's one of the major responsibilities of a, of a board of directors. And number two had been executive compensation, so setting compensation and equity strategy for the execs. Number three was really weighing in or commenting on strategy and the financial situation for the company. Now what we're seeing is talent is actually infiltrating every single board meeting, whether it's succession planning for the executive leadership, whether it's recruiting executive leadership, um, realigning the organization to make the company more successful, and what type of people do we need to fill in those gaps. In every board meeting that I attend with Avalara, there's a, a large component of it that is people related. When I was recruited to join Avalara, I felt very fortunate because our CEO, Scott, he's a CEO that I think got it. He didn't need me to sell him on why a CHRO on the board is critical to his business. He knew it already, and he was in search of one. 
in fact, he had made some structural changes to the board where the, the compensation committee of the board, uh, he had changed the name of it to be the Compensation and Leadership Development Committee of the board because he said, it's all about the people. I get it, it's all about the people. So I want someone in that boardroom who's gonna be the voice of the people, whether that's the voice of the talent that we need to bring into the organization, the voice of culture in the organization, or the voice of recruiting. I want someone in the boardroom who's gonna be able to lend to that. That's fantastic. Great, and, um, and Michelle, so let's, let's kind of go to you for a minute here. Um, there was a point in time in your leadership as CEO of Imperva, maybe 2016-ish, where the board was all male and the C-suite too, I, I think. Um, this troubled you greatly, and you worked hard to bring Jerry Elliott to the board. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how, you know, I think you realized the importance of diversity at a time, you know, when uh, many companies weren't even really thinking about this at all. Uh, it, it's in everybody's mind now, but can you tell us a little bit about how you came to pursue Jerry um, and, and the difference it made to have Jerry on your board? Of course. Well, first of all, I was, um, I was the guy in the suit at the time uh, when I ran Imperva, and I've got four daughters. And uh, I kept looking at our organization, the board, the employee base, and realized we're just under, underserved. Um, and I think getting Jerry on the board was, was critical because it began to shift the discussions of the board. It still didn't change the board as much as I wanted because it, you, having one diverse person on the board is interesting, but they oftentimes have to conform to the rest of the board. Yeah. Having two or three, then it begins to change the discussion because there is strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. She was fabulous. And I, and I think it was, I took that and then I began to change our marketing organization and, and made some structural changes in some of the operations and tried to gain as, you know, as many women executives as possible. And, and how did you go about finding Jerry? So I went through um, my network and I, I went through an re executive recruiter. Okay, oh yeah. And, and tell me, you know, as you said, uh, it, we sort of have this, I think the people of talent understand that it's one thing to have one person, but that doesn't really create, as Michelle was saying, it doesn't, create quite the level of confidence and inspiration that two and then three people do when you've got underrepresentation in a room. Um, so was Jerry the, the, the sole woman for a while and what happened, was she able to? Jerry, Jerry was the sole. I did not get a chance to appoint the second as I stepped down as CEO in 2018 mm -hmm. and held the board seat as chairman, but then at that point the new CEO wanted to have his, his, his fingerprints on it. Yeah. But she was really good, and, and she, I think she gave us a different perspective in terms of the questions she asked and whatnot. Well, she had a nice touch. I've, I'll jump in. I've been really fortunate. At Valera, I was the fourth female board member to be added. So we have over 40% women represented in the boardroom right now with Avalara, and it actually changes the dynamic. When I was in the C-suite at NetSuite, I was the only woman in the room, and there's a certain weight you have on your shoulders as the only woman in the room, but when there's four of you in the room, it's amazing how the dynamic changes. Uh, the women, the way they interact with each other, the way they question each other, the way we interact with the men in the boardroom is completely different than when I was the single woman in the room. So so, you know, diversity, the nice thing about that is you make the first step hiring the first woman and they pull other women into the organization. The same thing goes with diversity. You make the first diverse hire, they will start pulling people into the organization that are also diverse. And what you get is a better end result. Collaboration amongst a diverse group of people has a different result than collaboration amongst a group of same-minded people. Right. And I think diversity isn't a charity. Um, and, and I don't think CEOs or boards are altruistic. Um, they focus on results. So right. getting the right person on, on board, the right diverse um, employee base does change everything. Decisions are made faster, uh, company production, uh, productivity is better, companies are higher valued. Um, and the stats do bring this out, by the way. Yep, absolutely, that's great. Kathy, I wanna go back to um, some further inspiration for, for this room here, this audience, to dream big and consider that not only is their function being listened to in the boardroom, um, but that their career could lead them to the boardroom. Uh, it, it used to be that the CRHRO was um, maybe not even seen as a business function, yeah. and perhaps reporting to the CFO, you see much more of CHROs now reporting directly to CEOs and, um, and, and being in regular attendance in the boardroom, uh, even as uh, not, not necessarily board members. 
Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing yeah. uh, in those conversations. Sure, I mean, it's been quite a journey. So 20 years ago when I left the consulting side of the world and went into HR, HR was just still seen as the personnel office. People down the hall who could sign your employee change form, sign off on your time cards. In the last 20 years, particularly here in Silicon Valley, uh, I really saw it evolve, which was fantastic, that it started evolving into much more of a strategic function. Um, the ability to provide data and analytics, I think, to the C-suite has made all the difference in the world. My, during my time at NetSuite, I was really fortunate, and NetSuite had a pretty robust system of tracking employee data, tracking talent data, and we could pull together an awful lot of information to present at the C-suite level and at the board level that would allow them actually to make strategic decisions, whether that was on financing or budgeting or hiring or which next location they were going <coughs> to greenfield based on data that was coming from my function. So I've seen in 20 years it really the HR and talent function being elevated. At NetSuite in particular, when I joined NetSuite, we were in a rapid, rapid growth period, and the CEO at the time had told me that hiring was the most important thing. So the most important strategic imperative of the company at NetSuite in, in 2013 was to hire bodies because every enabled salesperson led to increased top line revenue growth. Every smart developer that we retained led to better enhancements and quicker release times on our product. And frankly, in a software company, people are your, it's your biggest line item on the P&L. It is your number one expense. So coming into NetSuite to hear that the number one strategic initiative in the company was hiring talent Talent, it was like a dream come true. And I knew that everything that my team did mattered. The fact that we could then report on the data and take that to the C-suite, it made them hunger for more data. It was really interesting. So we had on the board at NetSuite, Billy Bean, who is uh, with the Oakland A's organization, Mr. Moneyball, he was on our board. And he would challenge me in board meetings to say, get me more data. I want to see the cross-correlation of how many women have been promoted into manager and how many of them were organically hired as you know young college grads versus how many were experienced hires that we pulled away from another company and the more and more data I could produce out of our systems the more they wanted the data and the more they started relying on the data to make strategic decisions so take go fast forward to 2016 we're bought by Oracle and I start thinking about what's the next step in my career and I'm dreaming big I'm dreaming I want to be on a board because I, I've really enjoyed my interactions over my 20 years with the different boards that I've helped and I wanted to be on the other side of that table sort of driving those more strategic conversations and as I said in my intro that was almost unheard of back then when Coco and I first started chatting but I think today now the HR function and the talent function has evolved because of data, because of analytics, because of the ability to crystallize those into bottom line impact. They're now, all these companies are searching for people with my background, not only to help on the talent acquisition function and on the, the executive comp function and the hiring and firing of, of C-suite talent, but also on how the bottom line is impacted by talent, how it's impacted by turnover, retention, and cultural issues. So the time has never been better, I think, for people in our profession, in the talent acquisition profession, in the human resources profession, to dream big and, and take that next step and put your name out there that this is something that you're interested in doing in the future. And you see organizations cropping up now to actually help people with our background get into the boardroom. Yeah, absolutely. I have a special place in my heart for that too. I started my career in HR and I'm a, a psychology major, so people is, is, is definitely my orientation in the world. Um, Michelle, I want to ask you a question again. Um, how are you feeling four years later? You know, now the CEO, meaning, you know, we talked a little bit about getting Jerry Elliott on, yeah. on your board. Now the co-CEO of He Said, she, she said, as you look back to that time as a notable tech CEO, um, knowing what you know now, what would you wish to have, you know, how would you wish to have acted differently as a, a CEO, a tech CEO? Um, what would you counsel your, how would you counsel yourself differently? Fair. Kind of advice for the CEOs who are here. I, I think, as, as, you know, we all grew up in certain kinds of companies in the Valley or elsewhere, and those companies have behaviors <coughs> and are going forward behaviors informed by those companies. So when I first started out running Verity as, as CEO of that, I was 40 or so. Um, it was, it was a transactional business, and HR was viewed as transactional. Mm -hmm. It was hiring and firing, 
little bit of facilities perhaps, mm -hmm. but it wasn't strategic. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until I would say Coverity um, and, and our HR head there that I began to realize the strategic nature of HR. Mm -hmm. So I wish I could go back and change that because that would have, that would have changed some of my decisions as well. I would have yeah. looked more at, at diverse workforces as opposed to the tyranny of the urgent of having not get butts in seats to drive revenue and dev. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, at Imperva, I had just a tremendous head of HR, um, Brett Hooper, who'd come from Schlumberger, wonderful talent, super smart, and I think all of the changes as well in the boardroom with, with regards to compensation, retention, all of these issues around governance, kind of is a forcing factor to, to, to get the CHRO a bit more strategic and, and a place at the table. And I, he really had it there, but I, I, it took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice to see that, that HR is finally getting a seat at the table. To, to, to both of you, um, this audience of talent leaders um, gets tremendous pressure to hire fast. Um, and that can fly directly in the face of hiring for diversity, right? Uh, because hiring fast means you go to the places where you know the talent is easiest most easily found and where you've created your own ecosystem of uh, a network that works for you. So, um, and slowing down to make diversity work can be very difficult for a company. What do you say to that? You know, how, how can we help them push back to make sure they get the space to hire right and the tools to do so quickly? I'll jump in. I, I mean, I think it starts at the C-suite. They, they have to make this be a strategic imperative to hire diverse, because if they're pressuring you for your time to fill and to get it done as quickly as possible, and you've got all these recs sitting there open on your plate um, with management pushing, because you know line management is going to push. They want to fill the recs too. It's really hard to say, no, no, let me give you a diverse slate. Let me keep working. Let me go back and find another candidate. But if it's coming from the top at Avalara, it certainly comes from the top. Scott McFarlane mandates that a diverse slate's put in front of him for any candidate that we have, any position that we've got open. And he knows that's going to be at the sacrifice of time to fill, uh, but ultimately he sees that it leads to a better outcome at the end, that you're going to get a, a more diverse workforce, is going to have more creative ideas, better collaboration, and they're going to pull in more diversity as well. So if it's not coming from the C-suite, I think it's an uphill battle. That's my opinion. Yeah. I, I agree. There's a, there's a tone at the top discussion to be had. I think the other piece, though, is white males occupy about 36% of the U.S. population. So if all you're going to hire is, is white men, God forbid, um, <laughs> you're missing most of the hires. It's, it's like saying, I'm only gonna hire st from Stanford and Cal. That's it. Yeah. <coughs> you restrict the pool, you restrict your pool. And again, when you, when you bring a more diverse workforce and it does change the dynamics. Yeah, I'll give a shout out to, I think um, somebody from uh, Levity is here, but um, I have a story. I, I met the, um, the, the CEO and COO co-founders of uh, BetterUp and uh, Eddie and Alexi, and they were talking about how much diversity they, they have in their company. Uh, and the first engineer they hired was uh, a black engineer, and that person helped them bring in another black engineer. And then the two of them came to Eddie and Alexi and said, hey, do you mind if we go to Afrotech? And Eddie and Alexi said, yeah, what's that? And uh, they said, well, you know, it's this, this great conference where you know, people of color are coming together in technology. And, they said, great, can you recruit there? Um, <laughs> which the answer is yes, you can. And what's amazing to me is that uh, Afrotech in 2019, and I'm, you know, if I get this wrong, somebody will correct me later, but was in Oakland in the fall and attracted, I think, 5,000 or more people of color. It's in our backyard. And when I talk to CEOs, they frequently have no idea what I'm talking about. So I think you know, part of it is we, we, we have to get creative. Um, I, I'll tell you one more story on that front. I was speaking on a panel uh, that was talking to women about you know, sort of where they can go and what their inspiration is. And there were a couple of guys in the audience. And one of them came up to me afterwards and he said, hey, I'm a hiring manager at you know, Lockheed, I think it was. And I said, why are you here? And he said, because I'm trying to meet women. <laughs> <laughs> Meet or hire? <laughs> to hire. <Okay>. Exactly. <laughs> Clarify that. 
my point is, you know, he's like, look, people are telling me I've got to hire diverse, so I'm trying to figure this out. I'm not leaving it just to recruiting. I'm not leaving it just to, you know, the, the talent function. I'm trying to make sure that I create the right network, that I expand my own network, and, and that we all support each other, that I support the talent function as well. So let me ask another. We have about uh, five minutes, I think, left. I want to ask another question um, of you two, a uh, couple more questions. What are some of the big challenges you want to see talent leader, <coughs> excuse me, talent leaders dig in and tackle over the next two days here? Here. Well, I mean, continuing this discussion, I think, about diversity. I, Coco and I were chatting earlier back in the green room that we've, we feel like we've made a lot of headway in elevating women into the boardroom and getting more representation, female representation in tech and in management and leadership and all the way up to the board level. But what I see is on the other diversity we're not doing as well. So minorities in the boardroom um, is very underrepresented. There aren't a lot of Asians in the boardroom, African Americans. Um, we're really lacking on that. And, and I think hiring in the Valley, uh, that's become a challenge too so uh, you know going to Afrotech and finding these avenues hiring veterans those are things that I think the next generation of recruitment really needs to start focusing on because the women we've got a lot of momentum and it's like a flywheel because we've got women now in leadership women are pulling in more women into leadership and into the boardrooms as we talked about but I'd like to see more on the on the other underrepresented groups because again I think the more diverse your c-suite is the more diverse your team is the more diverse your board is the better the financial outcomes are for the company and then I think also just just discussions around when you, when you place your your early diverse employees Choose the right ones, because if you choose one that fails, that, that'll be held up as, as the banner that will, can't hire that person in because they failed. So you've got to pick the right ones and make them successful. It's, it's a very different feeling. So I've 35 years in the Valley, opened the NASDAQ three times, NYSE once, and when I walked into a meeting in a suit, I was great. I walk into a meeting now, I get, the people roll their eyes. Right? So I, I think the other thing they re realize is whoever walks in, I mean, there's... There's no trans group to go hire from, not that I know. There's a group called Gangels in New York, which is a LGBT uh, investing group where, where there's employees. But you've got to just pick the right ones and, and, and understand that for them, for the folks you hire, for that first African-American, for the first trans, it's lonely. You're the only one like you in the room. Only one. Yeah. And so you've, you've got to figure out how to, how to get them onboarded and integrated and make them feel part of the family. And then I would say report back on your successes. So elevate it up to your head of HR, or your VP of talent, or to whoever's running your organization. Highlight your successes on how well you've done in bringing in minority talent, how successful they've been in the organization. Work with your HR business partners to find out how these people are performing once they come into the organization, and really help give the information and the data to senior level leadership so that they could say, yeah, this actually does have an impact on our bottom line. Right. And I think I'll contribute to that too, thinking about how <clears throat> part of the challenge for people who are underrepresented is that there aren't as, um, you know, we don't have as many stories of when I did this here and when I did this there and when I did this in the other place to tell of success. And so sometimes you're, you're giving someone the opportunity and you need to learn to articulate how, why giving people opportunities is better for the organization and what the organization then needs to do to rally around to make sure that person succeeds. Um, one last question. We have just a uh, lightning round, I suppose. <laughs> Closing comments. Um, you know, here, here we are, a thousand people who are going to hire a million people um, in 2020, the year of 2020 the year of 2020 vision. Um, what is your optimism as you look forward for the world of talent from the perspective of the C-suite, the boardroom? Good. I, I, I think the good news is it's changing be because there's a tone at the top discussion that's taking place now. I think given that organizations are starting to realize that diversity drives better performance and better outcomes as opposed to do it because it's a nice thing to do. I think that's an important message that has to get out. Yeah. And I still think a lot of hiring managers are so focused on the tyranny of the urgent of getting people on board that they'll be reticent to search too far afield from their normal base. But, but I think it's starting to take place. What I love is that now you can go where the talent is. Uh, back 20 years ago, we were only hiring in the Bay Area because we all had to have cubicles and be physically located all with each other in a building somewhere here in the Valley. And I think 
we've all seen that change dramatically where you can actually go and find talent where they are hanging out and where they are living and you don't have to convince them to relocate to the expensive Bay Area. So that opens the talent pool way, way more than what we used to deal with. And I think leadership gets that now and they get that you don't need a cubicle for everybody that you hire and people can be trusted to work out of their homes or work remotely. And, uh, and I think that should lead to better outcomes. It should be leading you to find the right person for the job, not based on their geography, but based on the talent that they possess. Love it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. This was, was a lot great. of fun. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.